Recording is rolling. It's Thursday, September 30th, last day of September. Oh, I do want to remind you guys, your open notes take home uh, forces quiz is due tomorrow. A lot of you guys have turned that in already. And also your impact forms are due through your fifth period class. So remind you guys that too. And so now today is finally the day that we get to talk about centripetal force. Remember one of the stories that's been recurring in this class has been if you're sitting in a car, can you feel the speed of the car? And you guys are saying, oh, no, you can't feel that. The Earth right now is spinning. We're at a latitude. We're at a latitude where it's spinning almost a thousand miles an hour. Can you feel that? Uh, no, you don't feel velocity. You can feel like forces and accelerations, right, which go hand in hand, right? You take a lot of motion. Uh, so uh, keeping that in mind, um, remember the, the three controls you have in the car that you can feel right, that involve force or acceleration. There's the gas pedal speeding up, you can feel that. There's the brake slowing down, you can feel that. Now, what was the third control again? The steering wheel, yeah, turning. And ah, th that's what we're finally getting at. So you guys are gonna have this set up, and if you have a model put together with, look at this, a couple Play-Doh canisters, Play-Doh canisters, string, PVC pipe, string, PVC pipe. Okay. So I'm gonna sw swing this to get this going, but uh, I'm gonna explain this on paper first, uh, and then show you guys live demo. Okay. So uh, I see four potential variables in this. I see uh, the mass of the swinging bucket here. Uh, I see, well, the, the other play the bucket also has a mass, but really we're gonna care more about its weight, which is a force, right? So we got mass swinging, we got a weight that's hanging. Uh, there's a radial size of the circle, and there's also going to be some speed that naturally sets up, I'll call it V, that's gonna represent a speed, uh, that can hold us all in a certain kind of equilibrium. Now, equilibrium, I'm gonna have to talk about that too. So the weight that's hanging is in true static equilibrium. That's to say that there's zero net force on it, it has the weight down, there's a tension the string pulling up, and those are gonna balance out. So you wanna set this up in such a way that this bottom plate of bucket does not move up or down, just kind of out there. But what about the top bucket? Is with this top bucket, it, suppose you have a circle that's like constant radius, it's going around two, 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 right? This radial size stays the same. Would this top bucket be in static equilibrium? What do you guys think? Would it have zero forces acting on it? Ooh, no. Actually, it does have a net force, which means it is not in static equilibrium. Uh, sometimes you might hear it called dynamic equilibrium, but that's not true static equilibrium because there's a net force. Now, wh why would that be? Well, think about this. If it's flying around a circle, what if you cut the string? Like that. Makes that sound effect. What, which way is this going to go? Is it just going to fly off tangent to its path like that? Like that? Sure way, wouldn't it? Uh, which means, uh, in Newton's first law of motion says that, one of the things that Newton's first law of motion says is that any object in motion wants to maintain its velocity. That's to say speed and direction of motion. But if it's not doing that, if it's staying on the circular path, that means that, well, maybe it instantaneously go in that direction, but then a few milliseconds later, hey, isn't it being pulled in to keep it on the circular path, like this dashed line? It's being pulled in towards the center, isn't it? That's what centripetal force is, which is the tension in the string, which is also equivalent to and supplied by this hanging weight. Right? That's why I care about the weight of this thing, you know, like, like Newton's. Right? Uh, you guys good so far? Okay. okay, so what's the relationship among these four variables that I pointed out? This weight, this radial size, this mass, and this uh, speed. Uh, there is some very uh, tidy equation that's going to uh, link those four variables, and you guys are going to uncover it between today and tomorrow uh, with science. You guys can do this uh, empirically. Now, if you have a very well-designed experiment, how many independent variables can you have at once? Just just one at a time, ideally, right? And so, okay, so back down, get here. Okay. Right, so. Uh, if, if you have four variables you're trying to juggle, like these four, then what that's going to lead to, think about it a little bit, is three separate experiments. So actually the lab page that you guys picked up, this page, there's actually different versions floating around. Uh, one for each of the uh, possible independent variables. Now there's different ways to do this, but um, we're going to do this way. I think it's the easiest way. So you guys see this V, the speed. Um, swings in a circle so that it's going to set some natural speed, and we'll treat the speed as the dependent variable, which means that these other three could each potentially be independent, but if you have one of them as independent, then keep the other two controlled, right, uh, throughout your particular experiment. So one lab page looks like uh, this, 
uh, here, if you are at home watching this video, then let me hold this kind of close to the camera and maybe like get a screenshot or take a look at that. Okay. So go across the top here. Uh, no, all, all the tables have the same uh, column, uh, the same columns, just different hash marks. So first column says mass hanging, but remember, I don't really care about the hanging mass. I really care about the hanging weight. Guys, how do you go from mass to weight? Multiply by? Yeah, gravity field, which would be about 10 meters per second squared. You can use that number. Uh, also, do they use grams? But that's off. That, that's one one thousandth of a kilogram, right? So when you multiply by 10 meters per second squared, you actually get a weight that's in millinewtons. Oh, but th that's okay, just, just as long as you didn't know, know that. Record the mass of the uh, swing and canister. Now, notice that weight hanging could be bold to get the, oh, the, the three bold ones are the three potential independent variables. But this particular paper, uh, notice that there's a bunch of hash marks underneath the swinging mass. You guys see that? All these hash marks? And what that means is that if you have this paper, the idea was to keep this controlled all the way down. Same thing with the radius. So radius is bold. It's a potential independent variable. But if you're changing out the hanging weight, then um, then the, the everything else you would keep controlled. Uh, that's what the hash marks are for. You just use the same number over and over again. Okay? Uh, speaking of these, uh, these masses, uh, I, I want to mention this to uh, for you guys. Um, so the most scientific way to measure uh, each of these masses is to well, use the measuring device. I, I've got digital scales back there. I've got triple balance beam. Uh, but there is a, a quick way to do it too, which is okay for this lab, and that's this. Uh, if you can't access the uh, those balance, th those scales, then the empty uh, canisters, well, the small plate of canister by itself is about six grams. The large canister, just empty, is about 32 grams. And then when you load them with these uh, little, um, these flat lab weights, then you can just add it to it. So this one says 20 grams. If I threw this in the uh, the big canister, I'd do 20 plus 32 would be about 52 grams. So if you want to do it that way, you get numbers that are plenty close enough to make this lab work. Right. Right. Uh, finish in this uh, table. Uh, time sub 10. So how do you swing this around at 10 revolutions and figure out how much time it takes? You guys brought your stopwatches today, right? And then divide that by 10 to get the time of one revolution. Uh, now, you guys know why you would do that, right? If you do 10 times, then divide by 10, then whatever the error is of starting and stopping also gets divided by 10. That's why that's good practice. Okay. But wh wh why do we do that? Wh why are you taking the time? Uh, this is all to figure out what the speed is, which I told you, think about it in terms of speed being like a dependent variable. Everything's going to uh, link to that. Okay. Uh, did you guys figure out, because I, I planted this question yesterday, how could you figure out what the speed is? Um, did you guys figure out between yesterday and today how to do that? How to figure out what this instantaneous speed is? Does anybody know? I was about to show it right on the uh, table. Speed is, you can calculate it. It says 2 pi r divided by time 1. Oh, what is 2 pi r? That's the circumference of a circle. Hey, that would be the distance that this top canister went for one revolution. And you, you would have the time that it would uh, took to make one revolution too. So if you take that distance, divided by the time it took to do that, ah, that would be instantaneous speed, wouldn't it? That's how you guys are going to get instantaneous speed. And so then you have the very last column says to square that speed. Um, that probably doesn't make any sense right now, but it'll, it'll make sense by the end of the lab. If you don't have this page that has the hanging weight as the independent variable, then you might have one with uh, split hash marks, which would be, you. Um, the swinging mass could be independent variable. So if you have this one, then you change out the swinging mass every time, but you would control for the weight and also control the radial size. If you don't have that one, you might have to pay for all the hash marks are in the middle. Uh, or, no, I did that one already. So all the hash marks are on the left side, in which case you would leave the two canisters just uh, alone, just leave them uh, closed the entire lab, but you would change out radial size. So you might be like 0.3 meters, 0.4 meters, 0.5 meters, 0.6 meters, 0.7, something like that. You would change out the radial size. Per trial, okay. that's good so far. Good so far. All right. Uh, oh, and then uh, finally, you might have a lab table that's just completely open table, just uh, just completely blank. Uh, I copied some of these just to make it easier to make uh, teams since there are like three different uh, team groups going around. Okay. So try to uh, find someone who has the same lab paper as you. Uh, if you have to swap out lab papers to do that, then that's all right too. Okay. Um, let's see. Questions so far? Right, so let me do a, uh, oh, I'm trying to make sure I mention a bunch of de details that I uh, 
see students run into. So you guys do know that this weight is what's supposed to um, be in equilibrium just by itself. It's supposed to provide the tension that's acting as the centripetal force that's holding this in a circle. Okay. So uh, do you want to grab this weight and hold it with your other hand while you're swinging this around? Do you want to do that? No, because that would introduce other forces that would throw this off. Uh, do you want this weight to bump up against the bottom of this PVC pipe? No, because again, that would throw it off. The idea is that the weight itself is supposed to represent the tension of string there for the centripetal force. So it's just supposed to be like this way. But what might be helpful is to take a little red flag right here, or, and then uh, as long as the flag doesn't move up and down, then you've got static equilibrium for the weight. Uh, I, I want to mention too that if you're really meticulous about gathering your data for, for this particular lab, like you, you're really careful about keeping this radial size constant per trial, and you're really careful with the stopwatch, then when we get to the graphs, which we'll put together to, uh, tomorrow as a class, the graphs will look really nice and they'll lead uh, to exactly the right answer. But this is also one of those labs that um, if you're not very meticulous about like keeping this constant or you know, like doing everything exactly right, then that'll also show up in, uh, in the graphs. So uh, how good a job you do at collecting your data today, it'll definitely be reflected in, in the graphs uh, tomorrow. So let me switch my camera over to let's see, the side here. And to show you guys, uh, you swing in this thing so you know exactly which one. Okay. So I've got a, a light bucket that I'm going to swing and a heavy bucket that I'm going to let hang down. Okay. And let's go. Somebody has a stopwatch and we count. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you hit ten, you stop the stopwatch. Suppose that took uh, four and a half seconds. Uh, how much time would it take for one revolution? Just be that divided by 10, right? So you'd be like 0.45 seconds, like that. Uh, notice that I was keeping the radial size uh, constant uh, throughout uh, that demo. And all right, I think I told you guys, uh, I think I didn't tell you. So you guys got the rest of the class to gather all your data. Tomorrow we'll put together the graphs, and I will walk around and help you guys out.